We now know a thing or two about classes. We know how to implement them and understand how valuable they are to write safe and efficient code, as well as the great benefits that they bring for readability and abstraction. There is only one thing missing. We still can't properly use them in our CMake projects, largely because we don't know how to create a library that holds the code that lives in classes. What we do know is how to create such a library from functions. Are classes any different? And here I have good news for you. No, no, they're not. In fact, the situation is very much alike to how we create a library out of functions. So lots of things stay exactly as we had them before. We still declare stuff in the header file, we still define stuff in the source file, and we still create static, shared or header-only libraries from these files, and we still use these libraries just like we did before. For a refresher, see headers and libraries uh, lecture from before. That being said, some things are different. We now have data, not only methods, so we'll have to learn where the data lands. Uh, the definitions in the source file must show that they belong to a class. And our methods also have some attributes, like the trailing const modifier. We must somehow deal with those. Let's see all of this in detail. As always, we will be looking at an example. As the various AI chatbots are so popular now, we'll write a very stupid one. And by very stupid, I mean very stupid. Largely speaking, any AI system is just a black box that trains by looking at uh, a lot of training data, stores them in some internal representation, and then uses this representation to predict certain answers when the new unseen test data arrives. Given that, our chatbot can simply be a class, and to design such a class, let's talk about the public interface this class must have. It should return an answer um, through a method getAnswer that gets a question as a string parameter. In order to be able to answer the provided question, we would have to train our chatbot. Therefore, it must be able to ingest some training data into the method train and do some magic to become smarter. Don't get your hopes high, though. That's about all the interface we need here. Now we would have to fill in some details. The answer is going to be a very simple struct holding the actual answer and its probability. And here is how you know that this example is fictional, because no chatbot will provide you this type of probability anytime soon. Oh, and uh, we can put the struct to be the class internal to our chatbot class. The data is also going to be the class internal struct, with its own data in the form of questions and correct answers to them, um, as well as some function to check its validity. I know it should be a class, but for now let's stick with it being a struct. The chatbot class must have some internal parameters that we train with our train function and that influence its answers. We will just call our internal parameter smartness and represent it as an int. What? I did promise you a very stupid chatbot. We will need some implementation for all of the methods we discussed above. The implementation is going to be really trivial. This is a lecture about C++, not machine learning after all. You can find all the details in the script to this lecture which is, as always, linked in the description to this video. Finally, we need a main function to test uh, that the bot does something. This example is a bit simplistic, but covers quite a few things that can happen within a class. It has classes and structs declared inside of it, it has methods and data, and some of the methods are even const. For now, we have it all in one file um, that we can easily compile from a command line, and you can see how it's done in the previous lectures, uh, of course, if you need a refresher. But what if we want to be serious about our development and make a library out of our chatbot class that we can then use uh, from our CMake project? Let's start by moving the implementation into a header file by simply renaming our chatbot CPP into a chatbot HPP, adding the pragma1 or include guard statements to the top of the new header file, and moving the main function to some other file, say main CPP, that includes the chatbot HPP. If we now try to compile main CPP, um, in exactly the same way, it still does compile. By the way, all the class member functions defined in a header file are implicitly inline, so no need to worry about the one definition rule or ODR violations. We can, of course, also put the appropriate commands into the cmakelists.txt file. If you are confused about the CXX setup part, see the lecture on CMake. If we only need a header-only library, we could stop there. But sometimes we want a compiled library. For that, we would have to split our header file into well, a header and a source file. Oh, and if you are shaky on the differences between the two, or why it is important that the class member functions are implicitly in line, do check out my lecture on the various kinds of libraries. Generally speaking, all the data, apart from static data, stay tuned for that, belongs in the header file. 
As for the implementation of any methods and static data, again, stay tuned for the later videos, we can move them to the source file, a new chatbot CPP file, leaving only their declarations in the header file. In the definitions, we must tell the compiler that we are defining not just a freestanding function, but one from a class, thus the chatbot four dots and the chatbot data four dots prefixes. Note also that we have the answers uh, as return type on the getAnswer function. For such return types, we also have to tell the compiler it is part of some other class, chatbot, in this example. Within the definition of the function, we can use these types without the prefix, as the compiler already knows that it operates within the namespace of a certain class. Finally, note how the const postfix in the function that needed is present in both the header and the source file. And that's basically it. Now we just need to update our cmakelist.txt file, create a compiled library in it and link it to the binary that has the main function in it. So you see, there is only some marginal differences here and there, but largely the pattern is exactly the same as we have already seen with the freestanding functions. It goes without saying that we can and should also test our classes with some unit testing library like Google Test too. I won't do it here, but do give it a try on your own. More on that in one of my previous lectures on Google Test. Now we know how to create libraries from the code that lives either in freestanding functions or in our own classes. We also know how to compile and link all of this code together with CMake, which means that we can write pretty complex projects from scratch while still maintaining a certain level of abstraction and overview over the logic. How cool is that? I have to give you a short glimpse into what awaits us next. It is a homework where we will put all of this to the test and write a full program with libraries and tests for them that reads an image, outputs it in a pixelated form to the terminal. So stay tuned for the next video. And on this, I want to thank you again for your attention. Do not hesitate to provide me any form of feedback in the form of a comment under this video. But other than that, I think I'll see you in the next video. Bye.